that he's the one that's changing us because we cannot change ourselves and boy do we need help sometimes amen what a faithful God we have he has promised to continue the work in us that he started thank you Jesus the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in only wonder the king of glory He's the one. The king of all This is amazing. This is amazing grace. Sorry. This is unfailing love. May you take my place. May you appear my cross. You lead him. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of all. Hallelujah. Rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. I sing for all that you've done for me. Sing worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered. Let me hear you, church. Worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. Let me hear you, church. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. Oh, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. 
I thank you. And right now, church, I just want you to just get a picture of that holy transfer where the Lord Jesus himself took everything from you and he transferred it onto himself at the cross. Don't carry that shame, my daughter, he says. Don't carry that sorrow and that sadness, my son. I have taken it at the cross. It's mine and it's under my blood, says the Lord. When you ask forgiveness, he says you are forgiven and he cleanses. So don't keep returning to the guilt and the shame. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In Christ alone. Is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh. In Christ alone, who took on flesh. Of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God. Well, hallelujah, I was satisfied. Here in the dark of Christ, I live. 
His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands, hallelujah, don't be. that you are the rock that does not move, God, that you are not shaken. Thank you, Lord, that you are stable, that you are constant, that you are that ever-abiding friend, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. How we need you, Jesus. I don't know about you, church, but I need him more than I did yesterday because God has more for us to do, right? He has greater things for us to do. and We need his spirit more and more all the time. And he is faithful. His grace is more than enough. Thank you, Jesus. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say. Sing it again. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say. I need you more than ever before. I need you, Lord. I need you. Say, more 
receive your grace. I receive your grace, Lord. Say it again. I receive your grace, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's more than enough. It's more than enough. You know, grace is his divine provision. It's for whatever you need. If it's physical strength, if it's mental energy, um, if it's um, just the ability to do all that he has called you to do, his grace is more than, it, it is more than enough, and it will be there when you need it. Amen. Let's just give God a big hallelujah, a good clap of praise. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, you can take a seat. You may have a group of peers sit before you, and they may find you not guilty, but that doesn't erase the cause of what you did. Right? Not so with God. When he says not guilty, it's as if it never happened. And so we are left with a problem because Christ himself asks us to forgive as he forgave. And we're these human beings with these human hearts. So how is it that we, that we respond to such a request? Matthew 6, 12 says, Forgive us our debts, our sins, as we have also forgiven our debtors. What if we haven't? Jesus answered a question that Peter asked him about forgiveness in Matthew 16, 22. And he says, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times times seven. Then he goes on to tell the parable of the unmerciful servant and what happened to him because he failed to forgive. 
You see, it not only takes humility to ask for forgiveness, but it takes just as much humility along with a knowledge of the Lord and the union of our hearts to give somebody forgiveness. Let me say that again. It takes humility to ask for forgiveness, but it takes humility along with a knowledge of the Lord's way and a union of our heart to His to forgive others. You know, when you forgive somebody, what you are actually doing is you are handing the sword back to them. And you are giving them permission to use that sword in whatever way they choose again. And guess what? They can stick it in you again. Think about that. Forgiving somebody is giving them permission to do the very same thing that they did to you before. But what did Jesus say? Seventy times seven. Now, again, we're human beings. How is it that I can have somebody do that to me over and over again and not get tired of forgiving them? Contrary to some teaching that is out there, forgiving is not just simply forgetting the sin. Forgiving somebody does not just mean you pull up the rug and you sweep it under there and think because it's out of sight, it's done with. In our lives, many of us have been wounded, right? Wounded by another individual. And when you just think that saying, I forgive you, is going to deal with it, you're wrong. We have to learn as human beings that God has given us a very powerful tool, and it is called the tool of communication. We need to learn how to communicate our hearts with one another and share our hurts with people who have hurt us in a way that does not hurt them, but in a way that communicates our own hearts to them. Because it's important that things get dealt with. Christ did not just forgive our sin, but he dealt with it by hanging on the cross with all its agony, all its pain, and then he died. But what he offers us is freedom. Freedom from the divine penalty for sin by the acceptance of what he did. One of our greatest freedoms is to know that we have been forgiven from our sins. One of our greatest freedoms is to know that we have been forgiven for our sins. But the second greatest freedom that we know is found when we choose. When you choose to forgive another person. Freedom is not just freedom from something, it's freedom to something. Freedom is not just freedom from something, it's freedom to something. When I was growing up at home, I lived in a house where it just so happened that my mother was my abuser. And as I got older, and I had to deal with that in my life, And I came to a place where I wanted to restore my relationship with my mother. The guy that I was in counseling with told me that I needed to go back to my mother and I needed to have a conversation with her. I needed to just let her know that what she did was not right. But at the same time, own up to my my own sin. That what she did to me was not the reason that I chose to rebel in my life and to go out and start partying and doing drugs and drinking and living my life that way until the Lord burst into my life when I was 28. But he said, don't go expecting. Don't go expecting anything from her. Because the reason I was going was to free my own heart. And you know what? When I freed my heart, from carrying that burden of what was done to me, guess what it equaled? I started a relationship back up with my mom that I could look her in the eyes and tell her that I loved her. I set myself free from carrying the, the, the unforgiveness that I had in my heart for her, and it allowed me to love her again. I led my mom to Christ. I forgave her. I led her to Christ, and I had a relationship with her until the day that she died. Because 
I allowed myself to forgive her. The act of forgiveness can help lead someone to repentance, thus allowing the opportunity for change to happen in their heart. Do you know when you offer the gift of forgiveness to somebody, what you're saying to them is, I don't hold that against you any longer, and now you have an opportunity to do something with it, to change your own heart. Because you can't change them. You can't change them. Only God can change them. But you're setting them free to be changed. So just as forgiveness offers freedom to another, unforgiveness leaves our own heart in a bitter bondage of resentment if we do not forgive correctly. Let me say that again. Just as freedom offers, just as forgiveness offers freedom to another, unforgiveness leaves our own heart in a bitter bondage of resentment if we do not forgive correctly. You know, resentment, resentment is like drinking a bottle of poison and waiting for the other person to die. Resentment is like drinking a bottle of poison and waiting for the other person to die. Because resentment is just killing you. Unforgiveness, resentment is just kidding you, killing you. And you know what else it does? A bitter heart shuts off your heart from being able to clearly hear the voice of God in your life. If you don't believe me, read the story of King Saul in the Bible. The resentment and the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the jealousy that he had against King David drove him mad. And he was the king. He did things as the king that he wasn't supposed to do even if he wasn't the king. The things against God himself because he was, went mad because of the resentment in his heart. So to be clear, there is a huge difference... Listen to this. There's a huge difference from being critical and from having a critical spirit. There's a big difference between being critical and having a critical spirit. And if you're unable to forgive, a critical spirit is soon to follow and come up from a root of resentment and fear, just as it did to King Saul in the Bible. There is always a reason for resentment, but it's usually caused by someone sinning against you in some way. However, there is no reason to hang on to it. There's always a reason for it, but there's no reason to hang on to it. If you're having issues that way, you need to find a place at the feet of Jesus. You need to find yourself in a mode of repentance. Because I don't care who sinned against you for what reason or for how many times. There's a heart issue that you have if you're unable to forgive them. So what I want to give you here is what I call five principles of total forgiveness. You know, years and years ago, I read a book by maybe, I don't know if you've ever heard of the guy, is R.T. Kendall. And I want to give some principles because, okay, I just said a whole lot about forgiveness. But how do you forgive an individual? How do you forgive somebody who has sinned against you? If you're taking notes, you can write them down. Number one, total forgiveness is demonstrated to us when someone shows us that he doesn't want anybody else to know what has been done to them. Total forgiveness is demonstrated to us when somebody shows that he doesn't want anybody else to know what has been done to them. When you read the story of Peter when he denied Jesus, three times Peter denied Christ. And I don't know if you've watched the movies where they have the eye contact, where Jesus looks at him eye to eye and he's just denied him three times. Jesus didn't take that opportunity to look at Peter and say, Peter, why are, you denying, why are you denying me? I thought that you were my disciple. I thought you loved me. Peter, I, I, I thought that you were going to give your life for me. 
And yet you just denied me three times. Jesus would have had every right to have looked him in the eyes and screamed out above the crowd at Peter. But he didn't do it. He didn't expose Peter's sin to anybody else. He already knew that that was going to happen. But he did not take that opportunity to expose Peter's sin. And so when somebody sins against you, you do not have to share that sin with anybody else. The Bible has another term for what we for sharing somebody else's sin. Anybody know what it is? It's called gossip. Gossip. We do not need to share anybody else's sin if you're going to forgive them. It is between you and them and the Lord. We protect the one we forgive. Number two, total forgiveness wants to make a person feel completely at ease. Proverbs 12.18 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You know, when my wife and I, um, I don't know, some of you may have heard our story years ago. So I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but when I talk about my wife and I being in counseling, we, we go every so often to a marriage counselor just to get a marriage checkup. It's a good thing. It really is. But one of the things that we do is that when we have an argument with one another, regardless of what it's about, regardless of who's right and who's wrong, it makes no difference. But before we split company... We take a moment to say to one another, you know, what just happened, what I just said, has nothing to do with my love for you. We reaffirm our love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And so showing anger and hatred towards someone who sins against you will always make them feel uneasy and uncomfortable. But Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up dissension, but love covers over all wrongs. You know, Jesus invited all the sinners to come to him, didn't he? He said, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Though we as human beings, though all the sinners at that time had sinned against him, what he invites for us to share with him is peace. And he makes us completely at ease in that peace. Number three, total forgiveness will not even allow the person to feel bad or angry with themselves. John 20, 19 through 23, Jesus' first words to the disciples who deserted him was, peace be with you. Peace be with you. It wasn't you bunch of jerks. <laughs> I was in here getting beaten, and where were you? You all ran around like a bunch of dogs with your tail between your legs. What's wrong with you? Now you're sitting here waiting for me to come back, and I'm just going to be nice to you? Peace be with you. He made them feel comfortable, even in the midst of knowing that they had all ran from him, sinning against their very wards that they said that they would protect him and be with him and never leave him. The goal of total forgiveness is to make the person who sinned against you feel good again. Convinced that they are forgiven. Psalm 32.1 says that blessed is he who forgives transgressions, whose sins are covered. We want them to feel blessed, not bad. In John 8.10, the story of the woman called in adultery. It says, Jesus stood up straight and said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she replied, No one, Lord. And Jesus says, I do not con condemn you either. Go, and from now on, sin no more. He didn't make her s get down in the dirt. He didn't make her squalor. He didn't make her beg. He didn't make her feel like a piece of trash. He looked her in the eyes and says, where are they that condemn you? 
I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. It's the same thing that he says to us. when We go to him and we ask him to forgiveness. Go and sin no more. So what if you go and sin again? You come to him again and you say, Lord, forgive me. And he says, you're forgiven. Go and sin no more. He never rubs it in your face. Now, he may be after something in your heart. And the Lord says he disciplines those that he loves. So he's working in you at all times. But he doesn't make you feel like a piece of trash because you sinned against him. Neither should you to any other human being. Number four, total forgiveness makes it easy for the person to forgive themselves. It says that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. I'm sorry, I just did that. So this in itself is the proof of total forgiveness, for it is the only kind of forgiveness that's worth anything, allowing one to forgive themselves. Because if they walk away from you, feeling as bad as they did, then we haven't done the type of forgiveness that needs to be done. We have to understand that our sovereign Lord has chosen to forgive in this manner. And if we are to forgive like him, that is how we do it. We must allow them to forgive themselves and move on in life knowing that they are. So number five, total forgiveness is demonstrated when we keep someone's sin hidden from the person that means the most to them. Proverbs 10 says, The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Do not let the sin of one be revealed where it will hurt another person. Which means you keep it to yourself. You deal with the person. You deal with the sin. And you set them free. So we are to forgive like God forgives. You know, interesting going back to the Old Testament in Leviticus 21. The the Bible teaches that the Old Testament priests could not have scabs, which were unhealed wounds. Because unhealed wounds disqualified them from the spiritual priesthood. Until you have truly forgiven, we are all prone to distort what comes from our hearts when they have unhealed wounds. And so Ephesians 3, or 4, I'm sorry, 32 says to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. So forgiveness, to sum up, is a two-way street. It's both understanding the great price that was paid for you, for me, for our forgiveness, and it is remembering the great price that was paid that we can forgive others in the same way. That's how you forgive. I think that as a church, not this church, as a universal church, that there are many great, great principles of God that because of the way society is, the way of the world is, is that we have forgotten just how strong those principles are. And so don't take forgiveness as something lightly. Again, if we go back to the beginning scripture that says that if we do not forgive others in the same way that Christ has forgiven us, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do with that hard saying of Jesus. So you may be sitting in here tonight and you may be in your heart carrying a grudge, carrying bitterness, carrying resentment against another human being. They may even be sitting beside you, and you have it in your heart. And I want to exhort each and every one that what you need to do is that you need to set yourself free, and you need to set that other person free. If you have a per- something in your life against somebody else, and you guys are separated because of a sin that's one's done from another, Be the peacemaker. Man up. Woman up. You need to go to them. You need to offer them that sword of peace. Even if they take it and stick it in you again, it needs to be offered. To set your heart free. To set free the heart of the one who has sinned against you. 
true and total forgiveness, just as the Lord has forgiven us. Let's stand. I want to just take a moment and a moment of silence. I I, I want to pray, um, but I'd like for everyone just to take a moment and just clear your heart, your mind. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord that question. Who is that person, God? Is there somebody that I'm carrying resentment and bitterness in my heart against? Who is it that I might need to go to and ask for forgiveness? Ask them for forgiveness for me harboring unforgiveness to them, to offer them the sword, to give them an opportunity to be set free and to set free your own heart.